Hello. In today's lesson, we will discuss the role played by the atmosphere in determining the weather patterns on the surface of the Earth. To begin with, we will talk about the role played by water in the atmosphere. Now, what is water in the atmosphere? What does water do in the atmosphere? Water exists on the Earth in three different states. What are they? Well, solid ice, liquid water and water vapour. And in the atmosphere, most of the water exists as water vapour. 98% of all the water on the surface of the earth is in the liquid form. Now the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is contribute for the following developments. Now what are the contributions made by the water vapor in the atmosphere? It produces the greenhouse effect keeping the earth warm. We talked about that. <clears throat> the water vapor molecules will absorb the heat radiated by the Earth's surface and then they will re-emit infrared radiations heating the surrounding atmosphere. So they play an important role in warming the atmosphere. The water in the atmosphere serves as one of the principal agents in weathering and erosion. In fact, rain is caused by water vapor in the atmosphere. It is rain that causes most of the erosional properties that we discussed earlier. Now, the third way, it maintains life on Earth since no life can exist without water. When we look for life, when we look for signs of life on a planet, we always look for water, because without water, life cannot exist. So, these are the three ways water in the atmosphere make it useful for us. Well, let's look at these in detail. It is the ongoing cycle of the water vapor into and out of the atmosphere that makes this all possible. Now the water in the oceans evaporate. Now what is the process of evaporation? Evaporation is the process of converting liquid water into vapor or gaseous state. Now remember, in order to convert a liquid to a vapor, you need to supply heat. You know, if you keep a beaker of water on a stove and supply heat to it, now its temperature increases and gradually the temperature will reach boiling point and after it boils, it begins to convert the liquid into vapor. And you need to continuously supply heat. That means the heat supplied during that time is actually used to break the water molecules. You see, in order that the water may become vapor, the water molecules have to break themselves from the forces that hold them. So, in order to convert water to vapor, you need to supply energy. Now, conversely, what happens when vapor condenses back to water? When vapor condenses back to water, that extra energy is released. So I want you to understand this concept very well. When water evaporates to become vapor, it absorbs heat from the surroundings. That means the surrounding will cool down. Evaporation will produce cooling. When water vapor condenses to form, liquid water, that extra energy is released, heat is released and it will warm the atmosphere. All right? This understanding is crucial for our discussions today. 
All right, let's talk about evaporation and condensation. Now, evaporation is the process of changing uh, liquid water to vapor by absorbing heat. Condensation is the process of changing vapor into liquid by liberating heat. That means evaporation produces cooling and condensation produces warming. The speeds of water molecules determine the condensation and evaporation rate. You see, if you speed up the molecules, the evaporation rate will increase. When you heat a given quantity of water, the amount of heat you give will speed up the molecules. That means the rate of evaporation will increase. What happens when you cool down a given space? When you cool down a given space, the speeds of water molecules will decrease. When the speed decreases, they will condense back into liquid. All right. So the speeds of water molecules determine condensation and evaporation rate. Evaporation and condensation both occur at all temperature. Suppose I have some water in this test tube. At any temperature, there will be evaporation taking place from its surface. Also, condensation will be taking place. So, the process of evaporation and condensation actually takes place at all temperatures. But by increasing the temperature, you can increase the rate of evaporation. And by decreasing the temperature, you can increase the rate of condensation. All right, shall I say it again? Evaporation and condensation takes place at all temperatures. But, if you increase the temperature, the rate of evaporation will increase. And if you decrease the temperature of an air mass, the rate of condensation will increase. Alright. The temperature of the air, the water vapor in the air, and the surface of the liquid determine whether condensation or evaporation dominates. Now, Normally, the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation will be almost the same. But, as I said, if you increase the temperature, as the temperature of the air increases, the rate of evaporation will increase. And as the temperature of air decreases, the rate of condensation will increase. Let me illustrate that using an example. Now, this is the ordinary air, the rate of evaporation equal to the rate of condensation. Now, remember, evaporation means the, the molecules from the liquid form goes into the vapor form. Condensation means molecules in the vapor form comes back to the liquid form. So, normal air the rate of evaporation equal to the rate of condensation. Now, if you cool the air parcel, what happens if you cool the air parcel? Condensation will dominate. The rate of condensation, more water molecules will condense to form liquid than the liquid molecules becoming vapor. Now, here is the situation when the air is cold. Only very few molecules leave the liquid surface. The number of molecules returning to liquid state will be more. So the condensation will dominate when you cool down the air. Now, what happens when you heat the air? Well, you see, this process is very, very important because as the temperature of air decreases, you see condensation will dominate. It means that is the time clouds begin to form. You remember I told you in the last class, when a mass of air arises, a rising air always expands and cools. And when the air cools down, the water molecules will condense, producing the clouds. So it is a condensation 
of water vapor in the air that leads to clouds, fog, dew, and so on. So, what happens when many more of the water molecules become slow enough? In a cold air mass, many more water molecules will become slow enough to change into liquid, and that is what causes the condensation. On the other hand, if you warm the air parcel, if you increase the temperature of the air parcel, what happens? Evaporation will dominate. More of molecules will leave the liquid than the ones that return. Now here is the illustration for that. When the temperature of the air is warm, the number of molecules leaving the liquid will be greater than the number that returns. Many more molecules in the liquid water are now moving fast. Why? Because the temperature is high. So that they leave the liquid and become vapor. I hope you understand the mechanism of evaporation and condensation. Evaporation dominates when the temperature of the air is high. And condensation dominates when the temperature is low. But remember, during condensation, the water, the condensed water will release the extra energy and that will result in the warming up of the atmosphere. Let's now talk about a familiar term that all of us know, relative humidity. What does humidity stand for? Humidity is a measure of the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere relative humidity. Now, warm air can hold more water vapor than cold air. If the air temperature is warm, the molecules of water can stay in the vapor form. You see, in order to condense them back to liquid, you need to decrease the temperature. So, when the temperature of the air is warm, the air can hold more water vapor. And when the temperature is cold, it cannot hold as much water as when it is warm. As the air temperature decreases, the ability of a given space to hold water vapor decreases. What does that mean? Suppose this is the room I'm standing in, and there is a certain amount of water vapor here. If I turn down the air conditioner and decrease the temperature, as the temperature falls, you can see at a certain stage, the glass windows in the room will begin to fog. You know why? Because the water, the space in the room cannot hold any more water vapor because the temperature is very cold and it begins to condense. It is the condensed water vapor that produces the fog on the glass windows and any other surfaces. So if you reduce the temperature of a given space, the ability of that space to contain water vapor will decrease. Alright, now if a given space cannot hold any more water vapor at, at a given temperature, that space is said to be saturated. So what is a saturated space? A saturated space is a space that contains the maximum amount of water vapor that space can contain at that temperature. Now that tell me, suppose this room is saturated. That means the room cannot hold any more water vapor. And if I decrease the temperature, what happens? If I decrease the temperature, the water vapor in the room has to condense because when I decrease the temperature, the ability of the space to contain water vapor will decrease. So some water vapor has to condense to form water. All right. So if the temperature of a saturated space is decreased, condensation will happen. Now, when a space is saturated with water vapor, you know that the humidity is very high. 
Now, relative humidity, I'm going to define relative humidity now. I want you to learn it well. Relative humidity is the ratio of the amount of water vapor actually in the air in a given space to the amount of water vapor that will saturate that space. Well, you know what a ratio is? We talked about it in our first class. Now, relative humidity is the ratio of what and what. It's the ratio of the amount of water vapor actually present in this room to the amount of water vapor that is needed to saturate the space at the same temperature. Now, I'm going to write an equation for that. Look at this. The equation for relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air divided by the amount that will saturate the same space at that same temperature. This is a ratio. If you multiply that ratio by 100, you get it as a percentage. And always relative humidity is written as a percentage. So, if I want to measure the relative humidity in this room, what do I do? I've got to measure the mass of water vapor in this room. And then I need to measure the amount of water vapor, the maximum amount of water vapor that will contain in this room. In other words, the amount of water vapor that is needed to saturate the space. So, the, I can say the mass of water vapor now I have in this room divided by the mass that I need to saturate the room at the same temperature and multiply it by 100, it will give me the relative humidity in this room. Well, look at the scenario. If a given space of air contains 50 grams of water vapor, Suppose this room now contains 50 gram of water vapor at this temperature and 60 gram of water vapor is needed to saturate the space. What will be then the relative humidity? Can you calculate? The amount of water vapor now in the room is 50 gram. The amount of water vapor that will actually saturate the room is 60 gram. So relative humidity will be 50 gram divided by 60 gram and multiply that by 100. So that will be, what is this value equal to? That is 83%. This is how you calculate relative humidity. And relative humidity is an important indicator of weather conditions. Now tell me, when the relative humidity is very high, Will you feel comfortable or will you feel very uncomfortable? Well, we say relative humidity is high. Some people say, oh, I can cut the air with a knife. It means the air contains maximum amount of water vapor. If you decrease the temperature of that air, condensation will take place. Okay. Now the temperature at which a given space becomes saturated with water vapor is called the dew point. Now can you tell me why it is called the dew point? The temperature at which a given space is saturated with water vapor. You see it is called the dew point because any further decrease in temperature will result in the formation of dew. That's why it's called the dew point. So, what is the definition of dew point? Dew point is the temperature at which dew begins to form. And when will dew begin to form? When the given space is saturated with water vapor. So, a measure of the temperature and the dew point. So, if I really want to measure the relative humidity in this room, I actually need only two information. I, I need to know the temperature of the room now, the room temperature, and then I need to know the dew point. In other words, what is the temperature, if I reduce the temperature of this room, 
at what temperature will dew begin to form? And that is the dew point. So suppose the room temperature now is 20 degrees Celsius. And I want to turn down the air conditioner until I begin to see dew on the glass windows. And the temperature at that time is the dew point. And once I know these two temperatures, I can use charts to find the relative humidity in this room. So if the dew point is close to the air temperature, tell me, if the dew point is close to the air temperature, is the relative humidity high or low? What do you think? Well, if the dew point is close to the, the temperature of the air now, it means the room is saturated. That means the relative humidity is very high. If there is considerable difference between the room temperature and the dew point, that shows that the air is relatively dry. But as the dew point gets closer and closer to the room temperature, relative, the relative humidity gets closer and closer to 100%. So when the dew point is closer to the room temperature, you feel sticky and hot because the relative humidity is very high. Why do you feel sticky and hot when the relative humidity is very high? Because when the humidity is very high, there is a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, and when you sweat, your sweat will not evaporate. You see, our body temperature is controlled by the rate of evaporation of the sweat we produce. You know, I told you, evaporation produces cooling. Sweat evaporating from our body will take away heat from our body, cooling down our body. You see, in order to evaporate, in order to convert water into vapor, you need energy. And that energy is absorbed from the body, cooling down the body. And that's why uh, when sweat is evaporated, when you sweat profusely, stand near a fan, you feel cold. Why? Because the fan will accelerate the evaporation and the rate of evaporation will be high, you feel good. Now on a dry day, when the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is low, the evaporation from your body will be very high. You feel cold. Whereas, when the atmosphere is full of water vapor, the rate of evaporation will be slow, you see, because the atmosphere contains a lot of water vapor, there is no room for evaporation to take place. And when evaporation don't take place, your body feels sticky and hot. I hope you understand the difference between feeling sticky and feeling comfortable. Now, early morning when it is cool, the air is nearly saturated and the relative humidity is very high. As the day gets warmer, the ability of the atmosphere to hold, now remember, the ability of a space to contain water vapor increases with temperature. So as the day gets warmer, the ability of the space to contain water vapor will increase and that means the relative humidity will decrease. So, once again, why do we feel sticky and hot when the relative humidity is high? Our body temperature is regulated by evaporation from our skin. The energy needed for evaporation is absorbed from our body which cools our body down. If the air outside is nearly saturated, very little evaporation takes place and very little heat is removed from our body. And that's what makes us sticky and hot. All right, what is the process of condensation? Condensation is the phase change when Vapor changes into liquid. Water vapor changes into liquid water. Now, as I told you, when water 
changes from liquid to vapor it absorbs heat the heat absorbed when water changes from liquid to vapor is called latent heat and that heat is contained in the vapor and when vapor condenses to form liquid that latent heat is liberated so condensation will produce warming because it releases heat to the surroundings so the latent heat that was absorbed when water changed into vapor is now released when condensation occurs i want you to understand that very well we will use that as we go on now for example one kilogram of water vapor condensing into liquid water releases look at this amount of heat 3.36 times 10 to the power of 5 almost half a million joules of heat is liberated into the air when one kilogram of water vapor condenses that means when one kilogram of water evaporates to become vapor this much of energy is absorbed and when that one kilogram of vapor condenses back to liquid water this much amount of heat is liberated and that will warm the surrounding air so when condensation occurs the surrounding air becomes warm so warming the air increases the buoyancy you see so when condensation occurs the air will get warm and warm air is less denser it will rise you see this is the process of cloud formation all right watch this again the warm air on the surface of the earth that contains moisture well the moisture at the surface is not not saturated now as that air rises the rising air will cool down and the cooling will produce condensation now remember when condensation occurs heat is liberated that will warm the air and that warmed air will become less denser and rise again and that rising air will cool down and condense again and condensation produces heat and that heat will heat the air it will warm it will rise again so the process of condensation and warming continues until you have great big clouds built up and this is the process actually of rain formation so the air must be at or near its saturation point for condensation to take place in order for condensation to take place the such the space must be saturated with water vapor now air can become saturated in two ways can you tell me what are the two ways air can become saturated with water vapor i've been building one up i told you one is reducing the temperature if you reduce the temperature the ability of a space to contain water vapor will decrease that means the space will get more and more saturated what is another way of saturating the space well to put in more vapor in the space so one is to add water to the air by evaporation that is one way to saturate a given space the second way is to cool the air to its dew point so the two different ways to increase the saturation is add more water vapor or decrease the temperature of the space now cooling the air is the most common way to produce condensation and that is what happens in the formation of clouds and the formation of rain when the air is warmed by the surface it will expand and become less dense relative to the air that surrounds it when the warm air 
when air near the surface gets warm it becomes less dense and therefore it becomes buoyant what is buoyancy buoyancy is the ability of a substance to rise so the warm air becomes less dense and buoyant and it begins to rise and when air begins to rise what happens now this process of rising air is called convective uplift now you know the meaning of convection well we have been building it up for quite some time convection is the process by which warm air will rise and cold air will sink so the process by which a parcel of warm air becomes less dense and rises up is called convective uplift now watch this the heated air at the surface of the earth becomes less dense and it rises this is the convective uplift now because atmospheric pressure decreases with height the parcel of air expands as it rises you see the ability of the gas to expand depends on the pressure as we go higher and higher the pressure is going to become less and less when the pressure is less the volume now increases so as this parcel of air rises it expands and what happens as a result of expansion expansion always produces cooling and what happens when a parcel of air cools down when a parcel of air cools down it gets more and more saturated with water vapor so the air that cools down becomes saturated and condensation begins to occur so when a parcel of air gets heated on the surface it becomes buoyant and rises as the air rises it expands and expanding air cools down and the cooling produces saturation and that saturation produces condensation you see that beautiful process of formation of cloud so the elevation above the surface where condensation begins is called the condensation level where the 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 water vapor begins to condense is called the condensation level now so we were talking about the convective uplift so far there is another kind of uplift called convergent uplift now what is convergent uplift now convergent uplift occurs when there is a low pressure region created when there is a low pressure region created air from high pressure regions will rush in to fill that place and that air rises up that is convective uplift actually uh, that is convergent uplift actually convective uplift gives way to convergent uplift because when convection occurs a region of low pressure is created which will then pull air from all directions resulting in a convergent uplift so as air converges into the center of a low pressure or cyclone it is forced to rise off the surface and you can see a cyclone is formed as a result of a convergent uplift as the air rises you can see as always as air rises it cools down and the water vapor condenses now the graph below shows the temperature how the temperature drops as we go higher and higher now this is the surface of the earth where the temperatures depending on the location on the surface of the earth the temperature will be different now here the surface temperature is about 14 degrees celsius now what happens as the air mass rises as the air mass rises to say 500 meters the temperature has fallen to about 10 degrees celsius 
So if the MS rises to about 1000 meters, almost a kilometer, the temperature is only about 6 degrees Celsius. So when the temperature becomes very cold, the rate of condensation, the air parcel becomes saturated and condensation takes place. So as the air parcel keeps rising, it cools down like this. And as it cools down, the condensation will begin to occur. Dew is formed when the temperature falls below the dew point. Now, dew and frost are related to clear nights and open areas. Is that right? When the night is very clear, that is when the air gets very cold. You know why? Because a clear night, the radiations from the earth will all escape to space. There is nothing to stop it. In order to stop the radiation, you need water vapor in the atmosphere. When the atmosphere is very clear, there is no water vapor. If it is dry, then the heat radiated by the earth will all escape to space. So a clear night is cold because of that. That means a clear night is the best time for the formation of dew. The temperature begins to fall and the air near the surface will become saturated. And when the air gets saturated, what happens? When the air becomes, the temperature becomes close to dew point, dew begins to fall. So air near the surface becomes cooler as everything on the surface emits infrared radiations. As everything on the surface emits, as it keeps emitting radiation, it cools down. And as the surface cools down, the air in contact with it becomes more and more saturated. And as the temperature nears dew point, dew begins to form. Now, clouds block these radiations from escaping, keeping the surface warm and preventing frost occurring. On a cloudy day, have you seen frost happening on a cloudy day? No, frost occurs only on a very clear day. Why? Because if there is cloud, the heat radiated from the surface will not be allowed to escape. It will stay in and warm the atmosphere. That will prevent the formation of dew. That will prevent the condensation of water. So clear nights are more conducive to loss of heat and therefore cooling. Now, look at the way the cooling takes place on a typical day. By midnight, say that is the temperature, as, as the hours go by midnight, say 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., by about 4 to 5 a.m., the temperature, you see, if the air is dry enough, the temperature will be cool enough for dew begins to form. And this temperature, can you tell me what this temperature is labeled T sub D? That is the dew point. So as, as the temperature begins to fall towards the morning hours, at a certain time, the temperature becomes the dew point. What does that mean? It means the water vapor now in the atmosphere has saturated the space. That means any further decrease in temperature, the dew begins to form. And around 6 a.m., if you come around, you see a lot of dew on the leaves and on the flowers and all over. Is that right? And as the temperature begins to climb during the day, the ability of the space to contain water vapor increases, all that dew will evaporate, everything will disappear. So as the temperature falls below dew point in the early morning hours, dew begins to form. In the morning when the sun comes up and the temperature increases, the ability of the atmosphere to hold moisture will increase and all this dew will evaporate. We know this, we have seen this happen almost every day, particularly in the winter season. 
Now, a grass blade or a spider's web is more likely to have dew on it than the ground. You know why? A, a grass blade or a spider's web has a much greater area and the amount of radiation they can throw away is a lot more than ground. Therefore, they will be much cooler and therefore conducive to formation of a dew. Now, grass or spider's web has more exposed area and tend to lose more heat. When it loses more heat, it cools down the air around it and when the air around cools down, it condenses water vapor there. Now look at a beautiful picture of dew on the tip of a leaf. I'm sure you have seen this. Now, and this is if you go into the field on a January morning or a March morning, you see this beautiful sight. You see the blades of grass covered in dew. And this is a cobweb where you, it's, it's visible, I'm able to take the picture of the cobweb because of the dew on it. Without the dew, you cannot get the picture right. Now, look at this beautiful picture. The dew on the tip of the leaves. Well, all these are natural uh, happenings that we all witness in our everyday life. Now, dew and frost first form at low-lying areas than sides of hills because cold air is denser than warm air. Because cold air is denser, the denser air will sink and the dew forms at the near the surface first. Now calm nights favor dew or frost formation because wind tend to mix warmer air above with colder air and that's the reason why in Florida particularly if the weatherman forecasts dew on a night what do farmers do they will put big fans in the farm so as to circulate the air to mix warm air and cold air so that so as to prevent the formation of dew now big fans used in an orange orchard on a very cold night is to prevent the formation of frost. Well, water molecules in air are continuously colliding. You see, when condensation occurs, the, the condensed water molecules will be very, very small. They will not be drops. will be very small, sh shall we call them droplets. Now, they are very light, they get suspended in the air. And in order that we may actually see it, these condensed water molecules have to collide to become big. So, water molecules in air are constantly colliding, but they do not join to form water droplets easily, even when the temperature is below dew point. Now, in order that this may happen, we need what are called centers of condensation. Condensation of water vapor into fog or cloud droplets take place only on tiny particles present in the air. So in order for condensation to take place easily, you need small suspended particles that will form as centers of condensation. You see, just like condensation can take place easily on cobwebs and the tips of leaves, in the air there are many thousands and millions of very small suspended particles. It is on these suspended particles that condensation begins to occur. If these suspended particles are not there in the atmosphere, condensation will not happen very easily. So, you've got to understand that very well. Condensation of water vapor into fog or cloud droplets takes place on very tiny particles 
present in the air. There may be dust particles or salt particles or any such very tiny particles. Now, such particles are called condensation nuclei because it is on those particles that condensation happens. That is the center of condensation. They're called condensation, condensation nuclei. Now, so, the condensation actually happens on a nucleus. This is a condensation nucleus. Now, made very big. It's about 0 0.0002 millimeter in size. It is so small that it is the size of an air molecule. It will not fall. It is suspended in the air. And when condensation takes place on it, you have an a droplet formed and look at the size of a small droplet it's about 0 0.02 millimeters it's a very small you see 200 of a millimeter you can't even see it very well and in order that a raindrop may form hundreds and thousands of these small droplets need to collide and coalescence to become a big drop the average raindrop is about 2 millimeters. So compare the size of the condensation nucleus, that is a small dust or salt particles where condensation takes place, to a small cloud droplet, to the actual drop that falls in a rain. Well, there are thousands of tiny dust, smoke, soot and salt crystals suspended in each cubic centimeter of air and they are effective condensation nuclei. In the absence of these, you see, you may not get rains very easily. So the smoke and soot and dust and all these are good things in the atmosphere because they are needed to produce condensation and rain. Now, salt in a salt shaker becomes moist on a humid day. Have you experienced that? You try to shake salt into your food on a very humid day, it doesn't fall. You know why? Because the salt has actually acted as centers of condensation. Water has condensed onto that salt, making it sticky. Now, after water vapor begins to condense, the condensation on the condensation nuclei, droplets will join to form big drops. The only way big drops can form are these droplets will collide and coalescence so that they become big drops. And uh, without big drops, you cannot get rain because these small droplets, when they begin to fall, as soon as they begin to fall, they evaporate and become vapor again. In order to fall, you need really big drops. And that's the reason why a lot of times you see clouds, but it does not rain. Why? Because droplets haven't been able to combine together to produce the drops that can produce the rain. So the process is slow. The process of forming drops from droplets is a very slow process and sometimes take hours or sometimes days and sometimes can never happen. Is that right? But some other times it can happen within minutes. It depends on how the clouds move. But we will talk about that as we move on. All right? What are forks and clouds? Again, the same process. Condensation of water vapor in the air. Fog and clouds are both accumulations of tiny droplets of water that have been condensed from air. Now, these are very small and slight movement of air upward will keep them from falling. These droplets are very small and small movement of air will keep them suspended in air and they are almost like air molecules so they get keep suspended in air and that is the reason why you see the thick fog very many times even when they fall they may not reach the earth they evaporate quickly 
Now, a fog is a cloud that forms at or near the surface when air containing water vapor and the condensation nuclei cools to dew point. Now, here you can see a good example of fog. I have some uh, beautiful pictures of fog. You know, um, we who live in Florida very often don't see much of fog. But um, yes, sometimes during the morning hours you see a lot of fog around when you drive. Well, another picture of fog, another one. Cloud forms when a mass of air above the surface is cooled to its dew points due to the uplift of a mass of air. Now the uplift of air mass can be caused by various reasons. Can you tell me some of the reasons that causes the uplift of air? We talked about it. Well, it can be caused by convection resulting in from differential heating. In the last lesson I talked about this. What is differential heating? Differential heating is some part of the earth gets more heat than the other part. The heated part, the air will become very warm very hot, it becomes buoyant and rises. You see, that is the convection produced by differential heating. That is one way to produce the uplift of an air mass. The second is mountain ranges that act as barriers. You see, if there is a big mass of air moving and it encounters a big mountain on its way, what happens? The air mass simply gets lifted upward. That produces the quick uplift. Now, mountain ranges are actually good for producing rain. You know why? Because a big mass of air, when stopped by a mountain range, quickly rises up. And of course, the rising air will cool and condensation will take place. A third way to produce an uplift is meeting of air masses with different densities like cold and warm air. In Florida, we are very familiar with cold front moving from the north. You see, when cold front moves down towards us, we got warm air and warm air will ride over the cold air. Why? because warm air is less denser than cold air. So if a cold front moves down from the north, here comes the cold air from the north, and this is the warm air, and this warm air will be then pushed up over the cold air. That is air and uplift. So an uplift can be created by the relative motion of cold air and warm air. Warm air will always be pushed up. And that will create an uplift, condensation, and rain. So all these are different methods. I want you to be familiar with that. These are different methods by which a given mass, an air mass, can be uplifted. And an uplift is important for producing clouds. The continual rising and condensation gives rise to the formation of towering Cumulus clouds often leading to rain. Now, what is cumulus clouds? I told you some time ago that when a mass of air rises, it expands and cools, and cooling will produce condensation, and condensation warms the air, and warming the air means it will rise again, and rising air will again cool, it produces more condensation, and that condensation will warm the air, producing further uplift. So, this happens in many stages. The first uplift produces condensation, and that condensation warms the air, and that produces further uplift, and that uplift produces expansion and cooling, and that produces condensation. And that condensation produces further uplift. And as this process continues, 
the clouds get become thicker and thicker and you have towering cumulus clouds. It is this continual uplift, condensation, uplift, condensation is required to produce these towering cumulus clouds that are responsible for the rain. You can see here I have the picture of a great big cumulus clouds as a result of this continual uplift and condensation. Now, that produces rains, and such rains are often accompanied by strong winds, lightning and thunder. Now, look at a big cumulus clouds that will bring rain, thunder, winds, and many other phenomena that we are familiar with. Another example of cumulus clouds. Now, cumulus clouds produce precipitation. What is precipitation? Precipitation is the term that we use to describe water reaching the earth in the form of liquid, solid, and so on. Is that right? Precipitation is any form of water that falls from the sky including snow, rain, sleet, and hail as part of the weather to the ground. All these are precipitation. Now, precipitation is a major part of the hydrologic cycle. What is the hydrologic cycle? Well, water in the oceans evaporate, and the evaporation of uh, the water gives a lot of moisture to the air and warm air rises due to convective or convergent uplift and this continuous uplift will produce cumulus clouds the cumulus clouds pours down rains and the rains will run down and will then come back to the ocean you see that is the hydrologic cycle the water cycle is responsible for most of the fresh water on the planet. So we are able to live comfortable life due to this hydrological cycle. Now, precipitation forms when cloud droplets coalescence, that means dro small droplets combine together to become big drops, they fall. Also, when ice crystals grow, we will talk about that, how ice crystals can be produced in the cloud. Now, the coalescence process of forming precipitation happens in warm cumulus clouds near the ocean in the tropics with salt particles as the condensation nuclei. Now, large cloud droplets are slowly less by friction and they collide and merge to form big drops. And depending on the air temperature, these drops will reach the ground either as rain or as snow. In cold climates, the condensed water will reach the ground as snow. And in warm climates, the condensed water will reach the ground as, as water. Now, water in the liquid form below freezing temperature is said to be super cold. You can actually cool water below freezing and keep it at a temperature below freezing. It is called super cold. And if that super cold water is disturbed suddenly, it will freeze into ice very quickly. Now, that kind of a situation happens sometimes in the cloud. Now, supercooled water droplets are often found in the upper atmosphere. You see, very often in the upper atmosphere, you have supercooled water droplets. That means water whose temperature is below freezing. But it hasn't actually frozen. But some sudden change in the atmosphere can actually create sudden freezing and then you will have ice uh, falling. You have seen that happen. They need ice forming nuclei to freeze upon and very often a dust storm 
will create that process. Generally, dust from the ground serve as the ice forming nuclei. A lot of dust in that super cooled cloud will actually form the will result in the formation of ice. Now, this gives rise to hailstorm that we are familiar with. Now, look at this. This is the result of super cooled clouds producing hailstorm. Now, some hailstorms bring down huge balls of ice which can destroy cars and even homes. Look at that. The hailstorms that are the size of uh, baseballs and uh, that can destroy cars and homes. Well, we will now talk about the major weather makers of the earth. What are the major weather makers on the surface of the earth? Can you tell me some weather makers on the surface of the earth? Well, the major weather producing agents on the surface of the earth, now take a note of this. The movement of large bodies of air called air masses that have acquired the necessary temperature and moisture conditions. Now the motion of air masses from different parts of the earth and as the air masses meet as they pass, all these produces different weather conditions and leaving fronts of air masses is associated with the motion of air masses. Cold front, warm front, we talked about that and we will talk about that again. The third major weather maker is the local high and local low pressure patterns associated with air masses and fronts. Actually, all these are interconnected. The motion of air masses is actually uh, propelled by the low and high pressures and the weather fronts. Now, let's look at the air masses. What are the different types of air masses and what is an air mass? An air mass is a large body of air of relatively similar temperature and humidity characteristic like a cold front and a warm front are big bodies of air mass now covering thousands of square kilometers. When we talk about an air mass, we are not talking about the air mass that can be contained in a room. We are talking about thousands of square kilometers, large bodies of air. Now, typically, air masses are classified according to the characteristics of their source, region, and the area of formation. The source region can have one of four temperature attributes. An air mass may be an equatorial air mass, it may be a tropical air mass, it may be a polar air mass, or it can be an arctic air mass. So depending on the temperature conditions, we classify air masses into these four major categories. And air masses are also classified as being either continental or maritime. If the air mass over the water, it will be maritime. If the air mass over the continent, it will be continental. That means you can now combine these two together. You can have tropical continental or continental tropical maritime, equatorial, is that right? We're going to look at these air masses. Now, combining these two categories, several possibilities are commonly found associated with the weather pattern in North America. Now, here is the air mass movements in most of North America. You have, what does MP stand for? Maritime polar. This is continental polar. Look at the directions of the motion of these air masses. Now, maritime tropical, is that right? Continental tropical, maritime tropical. So, 
the motion of these air masses gives rise to all the weather patterns that we have in the, in the United States and in the whole of North America. Maritime polar air mass moving this way and continental polar moving this way and uh, this is again continental polar. Okay, now most of the cold front that we get are coming from Canada into the United States. They are mostly continental polar air masses that carry a lot of dry, cold air. Now, maritime polar, continental polar, maritime tropical, continental tropical, and continental arctic are some of the combinations of these air masses. All right, let's now talk a little more about weather fronts the warm and cold air fronts. Frequently two air masses, especially in the middle latitudes, develop a sharp boundary of interface where the temperature difference between them becomes intensified. Now such an area of intensification is called a frontal zone. So when one air mass move against another air mass, there may be a, a zone which separates a big difference in the temperature and that is a frontal zone or simply called a front, a weather front. Now here is an example of a weather front. An advancing cold air is called a cold front and this is how Cold fronts are represented on a map with these triangles pointing in the direction of motion. And look at the warm front. As the cold front pushes in, the warm air recedes. But because the warm air is less denser and the cold air is very dense, the warm air will override the cold air. So the warm air rises at the front, which produces condensation, cooling, and therefore a lot of moisture. When a cold front moves in, this is why we get rain most of the time. A cold front is the transition zone in the atmosphere where an advancing cold, dry, stable air mass displaces a warm, moist, unstable, subtropical air mass. Now that's what happens very often in the winter month where the cold front will come and sweep out all the tropical warm air in the process giving us some rain and later on for a few days good dry and sunny weather which we love and that's why many people come to Florida during that time. On a weather map, the cold front is drawn with solid blue line with triangles in the direction of motion of the... All right. Now, here is uh, again the advancing cold front. The boundary between the warm and cold air masses always slopes over the cold air. You see, it's always... Um, slopes upward, is that right? The boundary between the cold and the warm always slopes upward so that the warm air can ride over the cold air, producing our usual rain. The sloping of warm air over the cold air leads to a forced uplifting, or we call the frontal lifting of the warm air over the cold air and which produces condensation. The uplifting causes condensation and the possibility of precipitation along the frontal, frontal line. A warm front is the transition zone in the atmosphere where an advancing warm subtropical moist air mass replaces a retreating cold dry polar air. Now here is a warm front advancing and a cold front receding. But again the net result is almost the same. You know why? Because the warm air is 
less denser, it is going to ride over the cold air. That again produces clouds and rain. On a weather map, a warm front is drawn as a solid red semicircles in the direction of motion of the front. The position of the half circle shows the direction of motion. And clouds develop on here because of the forced uplifting of the warm air. What are waves and cyclones? What are cyclones? Well, all these are weather patterns associated with our regions. Now, an advancing cold front and a stationary front often develop a bulge or wave in the boundary. Now, look at this. Uh, an advancing cold front and a receding warm front produces a boundary which bulges. Now, that warm sector which produces... Now, as the fast-moving cold air catches up with the slow-moving air, the cold air underwrites the warm air. Well, always that happens because the cold air is denser. The cold air will underwrite the warm air, lifting the warm air upward. Now, this lifting produces a low pressure. You see, as the cold air underwrites the warm air, it lifts the warm air, and lifting the warm air will leave a very large, low pressure area. So, lifting produces a low pressure area where the two fronts come together. And the lifted air expands. As the lifted air expands and cools down, uh, reaches dew point, forming what is called an occlusion. So the occlusion is the lifting up process of the warm front where dew begins to form. Now, an occluded front is one that has been completely lifted off the ground with the low pressure region at the center. Now, what happens when you have a front that has been completely lifted off the ground with a low pressure region created? Now, the low pressure region will now pull in air masses from all over, which will then be uplifted in a similar way, creating a great big circulation. And you have a cyclone taking birth. You can see this is the occlusion. The occluded front is one that has been completely lifted off the ground, which then produces a low pressure region at the center. A cyclone is a low pressure center where the winds move into the low pressure center, forcing the system upward. The upward movement associated with the low pressure center cools the air, resulting in clouds, precipitation, and stormy conditions. You can see when this happens, all these put together will create a very severe weather condition. The occluded front creates the low pressure, which will then pull in air, mostly moist air from the surrounding areas, and when moist air are pulled in, they are again uplifted, producing condensation and rain. And the circulation produces great strong winds. And that is a cyclone. A hurricane is again a cyclone. These are different names in different parts of the world. Hurricane is the term used to describe cyclones in the Atlantic and eastern Pacific Oceans, in the western Pacific, these kinds of storms are referred to as typhoons. So in the western Pacific, these kind of storms are called typhoons, and in the Atlantic area where we live in, we call them hurricanes. Now, most Atlantic hurricanes are born in the southern Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Africa, you see, you hear the weatherman talking about a wave is just coming from the coast of Africa. That means a front, the two fronts 
joining together and the occlusion is beginning to happen. That is the wave. A low pressure region is beginning to take shape. And depending on the conditions, that can either grow or die down. So it happens in the month of June through November each year. Now during this time, winds off the west coast of Africa sometimes converge, circulating counterclockwise. That is where these storms originate. Often these winds maintain a low speed and travel across the Atlantic, carrying these regions of low pressure or causing little more than rainfall or land masses they strike. Very often, these low pressure regions are carried by these winds, which causes nothing more than heavy rains or small winds. But sometimes they can play a trick and become very heavy, very strong cyclones or hurricanes. At other times, when the water temperature are warm enough and the atmospheric conditions are correct, you see, when the low pressure is formed inside that occlusion, if the water temperature is high, there will be a lot of moisture present in the air around. So, the air that is going to be sucked into the low pressure fuels the, form, the formation of the hurricane. If the water temperature is not very high and there isn't a lot of moisture available, then this will gradually die down. Now, hot, moist air from the ocean is pulled into the eye of the storm. Now, what is the eye of the storm? The eye of the storm is that low pressure region created by the lifting of the front, the occlusion. Now, so moist air from the ocean is pulled into the eye of the storm, which is now called a tropical storm. Well, the winds about 45 to 50 miles per hour is a tropical storm and that is the circulation really has started as the air rises and cools as the air that is pulled into the low pressure circulates rises and cools what happens heavy to torrential winds and circulation and you got condensation happening and you see when condensation happens more energy is released and that fuels the hurricane even further. The released energy pumped into the rotating cloud mass. The condensation results in release of energy. And that released energy is pumped into the rotating cloud of mass, making it go faster and faster. You can see a, a tropical storm will gradually grow into a hurricane. Now here I have the picture of a usual picture, everybody is familiar with it. I think this is the picture of Hurricane Charlie. I had uh, got uh, several pictures. So this is where the occlusion, the low pressure region, ultimately has given rise to the eye of the storm. Now by the time the winds reach speeds of about 120 kilometers per hour, that's about 75 miles per hour. It has now become a Category 1 hurricane. Well, as the spinning storm moves across the ocean, unstopped by land, wind speed increases. You see, if the system stays in the ocean, there is a lot of warm, moist air in the ocean that will keep on feeding the low pressure area. That means the storm will grow in strength. Now, the moment it comes on to land, the warm, moist air is no longer there to feed the hurricane. That means the hurricane will lose strength. And that is the reason why the hurricane catches strength while in, on, on water, and it loses strength when it comes on shore. Hurricanes are commonly classified by the strength of their winds into five categories. You know that. It is actually given by Sapphire-Simpson Hurricane Intensity Scale. 
In other words, hurricanes ranges from category 1 to category 5. The weakest hurricane with wind speed of about 119 to 153 kilometers per hour, that's about 74 to 95 miles per hour, are category 1 storm and cause minimal damage primarily to plants and trees. A minimal category 5 storm could carry sustained winds of up to 250 km per hour. Now, Charlie, which hit the Charlotte Harbor, and Katrina, which hit New Orleans, they both were category five before they hit the land. Now, when they hit the land, they became category four, but still they were very strong winds, and most of you know what damage these storms actually caused to the people who live around those areas. Now tell me, what is a thunderstorm? We in Florida know much more about thunderstorms than anybody else. Thunderstorm forms when moist, unstable air is lifted vertically into the atmosphere. You see, most of the rainy season thunderstorms we get on a very hot, humid day. On a hot day, the air at the surface of the earth will be hot. It, it is lifted up vertically. And what happens? The continuous lifting and cooling, condensation, then cooling and lifting, produces these cumulus clouds. And it is the origin of these cumulus clouds that gives rise to the formation of thunderstorms. Lifting off this air results in condensation and the release of latent heat. The process to initiate the vertical lifting can be caused by what are the processes that initiate this vertical lifting? Well, one is the unequal warming of the surface of the earth. We talked about that already. Second is the orographic lifting due to topographic obstruction. This is a repeat of what we already said. If there is a mountain range in the path of a moving mass of, uh, of air mass, because the air mass cannot advance any further, they automatically are lifted up. So the orographic lifting caused by obstruction on the path of an air mass is another reason for the lifting. And of course, dynamic lifting because of the presence of a frontal zone. All these will cause the lifting of an air mass that will eventually produce thunderstorms. Now, immediately after lifting begins, the rising parcel of warm air begins to cool because lifting produces expansion and expansion produces cooling and cooling produces condensation. Now, for the cumulus cloud to form into a thunderstorm, continued uplift has to occur in an unstable atmosphere. The, when the air contains a lot of moisture, it is unstable. So when the air contains a lot of moisture and this continual uplift occurs, that means the first uplift causes condensation and that condensation releases heat and that causes further uplift, that causes condensation, it causes further uplift. This continued uplift gives rise to what is called the cumulus clouds. I showed you a picture of the cumulus clouds. I think I have some more in here. Severe weather associated with some of these clouds include hail, strong winds, thunder, lightning, intense rain, and tornadoes. Well, here is one good example of thunder and lightning caused by a very big cumulus cloud. I think uh, we have experienced these kind of situations. So multiple lightning strikes from a thunderstorm occurring at night. Florida is the lightning capital of the world. 
Generally, two types of thunderstorms are common, especially for our part of the world. Now, what are the two types of thunderstorms? One is the airless thunderstorms, which occur in the middle latitudes in summer, at the equator all year long. And that is simply the vertical lifting of the air masses, the convective or convergent lifting. And the second type are the thunderstorms associated with mid-latitude cyclones or cold front. You know, very often we get sometimes very severe thunderstorms when a cold front moves in, if the air is unstable enough. Well, the most common type of thunderstorm is the air mass type of thunderstorms. And that is what is most prevalent along the equator where you've got tropical rainforest, where you've got lots and lots of rain. And all these thunderstorms are actually the air mass thunderstorms. Now here, this, there's the picture of how a cumulus clouds begin to form. Now look at the formation of these clouds. As the clouds begin to rise, at a certain stage, the clouds begin to invert. They begin to come back. You see, can you see that? The clouds bend. And it is at that time, when the cloud begins to invert, you see, layers and layers of clouds mixing together causes the droplets of water to collide and coalescence, producing big drops. That kind of a situation is necessary for rain to fall. So when the updraft, what is the updraft? Updraft is the uplifting, that this continual uplifting. When the updraft reach their maximum altitude in the developing cloud, usually about 12 to 14 kilometers, that is the troposphere, is that right? Inside the troposphere. They change their direction 180 degrees. They turn their direction and become downward drafts. And these upward drafts and the downward drafts then combine, they collide, giving rise enough opportunities for the droplets to coalescence to become big drops. Now, with the downdraft, precipitation begins to form. Why? Because there is opportunity for the small droplets to, to mix together, to collide together, and to become big drops. And so, the collision and coalescence processes produce precipitation. Now, here I have the drawing of that. This is the updraft, the rising of the warm moist air when they reaches their maximum height they turn around 180 degrees forming the downdrafts and it is there that coalescence and droplets forming collision and coalescence will produce a lot of rain and sometimes hail and so on at the back end of the cloud, the updrafts swing around and become downdrafts. The leading edge of the downdrafts produces a gust front near the surface. You see, the leading edge of the downdrafts produces a great big gust of wind. I'm sure most of us have experienced that. Before it begins to rain, you will find this gust that is uh, blowing across. And this downdraft produces a gust front near the surface. There you are, the blue arrows. Now warm, moist air that rises over the gust front may form a roll cloud. So this gust may result in producing further rising of the warm, moist air producing what is called a roll cloud. Here, yeah, this is a roll cloud in there. Not very high. Well, this is another example of a very high cumulus cloud as they rise. Look at the shape of that. As it rises to the great heights, 
it turns its direction. So the top of the cloud takes the familiar anvil shape as strong stratospheric upper level winds spread ice crystals in the top of the cloud horizontally. There you can see that horizontal motion. The mature air mass thunderstorm contains heavy rain, thunder, lightning, and produces wind gusts at the surface. But nobody needs to tell us that. We experience that very often. But you know, these days we don't really see much of this. Weather conditions are changing very fast. Well, most of these thunderstorms very often carry tornadoes. What are tornadoes? A tornado is a vortex of rapidly moving air associated with some severe thunderstorm. A thunderstorm can actually create extreme low pressure region which will suck in air and everything around in a vortex and taking it away with tremendously high wind. Tornadoes that travel across lakes or oceans are called water spouts. We know that. Now, winds within the, t the tornado funnel may exceed 500 kilometers per hour. That's the reason why practically nothing can survive in the path of a tornado. Now, the air pressure at the tornado center is approximately 800 millibars. And many human-made structures collapse outward when subject to such tremendous pressure drops of this magnitude. It is not the wind alone that collapses the structures. It is a tremendous pressure drop that causes the collapse of these structures. Now the destructive path of a tornado is usually about half a kilometer wide. So it will not be very wide and usually not more than 25 kilometers long. Well, not a very high region gets affected by a tornado. The rarest tornadoes are those with either an F4 or an F5 rating. So tornadoes are rated using um, an F scale. These events have wind speeds between 333 to 513 kilometers per hour and are very destructive and violent. Now, finally, let's look at some major climate groups on the different parts of the surface of the Earth. The Earth rotates about its axis, which is tilted 23.5 degrees. We talked about that when we discussed the Earth in space. And it is the tilt of the axis of rotation of the Earth that creates all the weather conditions that we see on the surface of the Earth. This tilt and the sun's radiation results in the Earth's seasons. Now the sun emits rays that hit the Earth's surface at different angles. These rays transmit the highest level of energy when they strike the Earth at right angles. So when the sun's rays fall at right angles, that is when the surface gets maximum amount of heat. You see, during the equinoxes, the sun's rays are falling at right angles on the equator. Now, during the summer solstice, the sun's rays are falling at right angles on the north, on the Tropic of Cancer. That means Sometime between 23.5 degrees south and 23.5 degrees north, every point on the surface of the earth between those two lines will receive sun's light falling at right angles. Now, when sun's light is falling at an angle, the amount of heat received will be less. Now, temperature in these areas tend to be the hottest. In what regions? In regions where sun's rays fall at right angles, 
the temperatures will be the hottest. Now, other locations where the sun's rays hit at lesser angles tend to be cooler. And this is one of the basic reasons for the temperature differences and weather patterns at different parts of the world. As the Earth rotates on its tilted axis around the Sun, different parts of the Earth receive a higher and lower levels of energy. So, if the Sun is falling at, if the Sun's light is falling at right angles on the Tropic of Capricorn now in the south, now as days advance, that will move towards the north and during the equinox the sun's rays will be falling directly on the equator at right angles when it moves it comes on the tropic of cancer and so on that's what this means as the earth rotates on its tilted axis around the sun different parts of the earth receive higher or lower levels of radiant energy and this is responsible for the different seasons that we experience. Now the Köppen climate classification system recognizes five major climate types based on the annual and monthly averages of temperature and precipitation. Now we will look at these five different categories of climate classification quickly. Now each type is designated by a capital letter like A, B, C, D and E. Now let's look at uh, these uh, quickly. Now A, climate classification A. Now what is climate classification A? Climate classification A contains Tropical climate, so A is mostly tropical climates and are known for their high temperature year-round and for their large amount of large amount of rain around the year. You see, because of the tropical climate, the most of the time, well, more often than other parts of the world receive sunslides directly falling at right angles. So those areas, I have used colors to represent that. You can see this is the maroon color. So what are the areas on the surface of the earth where you have a climate A, climate type A? You can see that's the Amazon rainforest. This is the Congo rainforest. And these are the Indonesian islands. All those areas are where you have a climate type A, where tropical climates known for their high temperature and year-round precipitation, which then encourages the growth of vegetation, and that's the reason why we have great big forest growing in that climate area. All right? What is B, the second type of climate? B are dry climates are characterized by little rain and a huge daily temperature range. Now, where do you find that? You can see dry climates are mostly in the arid desert areas. And huge difference in temperature between the day and night. You see when you have a very dry climate, during the day the temperature will be very high because the sun's energy will be absorbed by the sun's earth surface. During night, because the air is dry, all that energy will be radiated away. So the nights will be very cold. So that is climate B and you have a lot of areas where the, that type of climate is seen. Now climate C is what I have used green light for. What is that climate? Now in humid middle latitude climates, land or water differences play a large part. These climates have warm dry summers 
and cool wet winters and you see Florida's climate is actually very close to that there you are and actually most of the United States form come under the climate C classification C where you have humid middle latitude climate that is uh, play a large part these climates have warm dry summers we have pretty warm well we got dry summers and and, and wet summers and of course uh, when uh, the cold front moves in during the winter we get a lot of rain so that is climate C now how about D the blue regions but well, you can say what these blue regions are they are closer to the poles they are cold regions so continental climates can be found in the interior regions of the large land masses total precipitation is not very high they don't get a lot of rain but the seasonal temperatures vary very widely well we got one more and that is the E region now what is the E region here cold climates describe this climate type typically so that is very cold that will be towards the poles now these climates are part of areas where permanent ice and tundra are always present that's of course the climate that describes the Arctic and the Antarctic so we got these five major climate groups it'll be nice to look at each of those I have uh, actually classified them that's group A that's group B is that right now group C and group D is the blue and group E is the climate that you see around the poles well I think we went through a great description on the atmosphere and the weather patterns on the surface of the earth and uh, we're going to conclude our discussion on the surface of the earth the atmosphere with this and we have two more lessons in this section we're going to look at the water resources and water management on the surface of the earth all right i will see you for that lesson shortly